All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, man, I am excited for this conversation. This is uh, going to be just one of those conversations that I think I'll be able to point a lot of people back to. I think everybody who's watching at home will be able to point a lot of people back to. If you ever get the the the, the backlash of, quote, crypto's not used anywhere. You can't buy anything with crypto. You know, can you, what can you spend crypto on, right? How many people at home have like heard that? seen that or whatever um if that's you you're gonna refer him back to this because i've got trevor filter who's the co-founder of flexa which is doing everything humanly possible to get crypto moving from consumers to merchants and back and forth man we are so excited to have you trevor how are you doing today i'm better now bryce gosh <laughs> i gotta feel some of that because that is exactly how we feel about what we're doing here at flexa and i'm uh i'm super excited to be here first of all thank you for having us um, again, I know one of my co-founders was on a few years ago, uh, pre-pandemic era, but no, Flexa is doing some really exciting stuff. Now we are working with some exciting companies where we're working on some exciting products. And I'm really here to chat with you today about the future. So let's, yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, we'll dive in. Um, so how kind of customary here, what we like to do is we always like to kind of get acquainted first before we get into the, the meat and potatoes. So, uh, Trev, could you, if, can I call you Trev? Uh, just kidding. Um, but Trevor, you know, we're really excited. Uh, we, we just want to know your background a little bit about what you were doing before you went, you know, full on sleeves rolled up full dive in crypto. What were you doing before? Yeah. So I have been in payments for my, oh gosh, 15 years now, uh, in one form or another, working on my own payments projects for the last 10. Flexa is the, the third payments focused startup I've worked on. We like to call it the first payments, I'm sorry, the first merchant first payments company. So so Flexa is basically a, a payments platform for enterprise sellers to interface with Web3. And we have been around for about six years now. Prior to Flexa, I was working at American Express. I was working for Bloomberg. I was working on a bunch of different deep in the weeds payments products. And when I first learned about a crypto, probably, I want to say 2000, 2015 or so, um, it was really fascinating to me how how just brilliant and and uh spot on some of satoshi nakamoto's original ideas about what was wrong with payments were mm -hmm. coming from from my perspective of spending that many years in the belly of the beast and so we've been uh we've been working to expose some of that tech to merchants uh, we're, we've been pretty lucky to count some very very large merchants among our customers chipotle regal cinemas ulta beauty and we work to help those merchants accept crypto. So I see Flexa as a, a synthesis of a lot of time and effort by a lot of people to fix payments. And uh, I'm excited to get into that today. Love it. Um, no, so, I mean, if we think about like crypto, it's to us, it's it's obvious this is going to be the future um, of finance, the future of, um, you know, the backbone of a lot of different technologies, um, financial technologies, it's going to kind of be that update to maybe the back end of banks and all this stuff. Totally. Um, and, and, and crypto was designed and built primarily, the point I'm trying to make is it was built recently in context of the internet. Um, but we have what exists today, at least in the West, um, is a credit card system that was designed and built before the internet even existed, really. And so, <laughs> so what, what's going on here? Why, why are people so reluctant to finally switch over? Or is it just a big undertaking? It's the latter, for sure. And we have some dates for what you just said, uh, which we talk with merchants about all the time. The first credit card, 1950. Credit cards suddenly stopped being a really easy and safe way for banks to accept payments. So credit scoring, 1956, they had to find ways to steal our data in order to secure payments <laughs> six years later. And then we've got the inklings of the internet with ARPANET in 1970. So there's this long wow. gap. But the internet, as we know, didn't really go mainstream until the late 80s or, or 90s. And so credit cards found their way into the fabric of society, into the fabric of these really large organizations, almost like... Um, like a cancerous tumor. And and what we have been doing for the last six years is talking to the 12 to 15 teams at each one of these large organizations to help them understand just what they can benefit uh, from adopting these Web3 technologies and adopting crypto as a payment method. You know, where we're going, we foresee, just like you said earlier, every single financial transaction, every single value transfer is going to use a distributed ledger behind the scenes. 
So how do we help merchants cross that chasm? Because it's very, very different. It came up in the internet, like you said, uh, and it's it's almost too different to just plug and play. Mm -hmm. But we have to do that. We have to get to that better place, right? And uh, that's what Flexa is here to solve. That's exactly what we look to do. We help sellers thrive in this new era of commerce. And so if if we think about Flexa from an, you know, an analog, would this be more akin to PayPal uh, or Square, something that you know people, there's like a point of sale? Walk us through a little bit about how we might think about what Flexa is today and many, maybe anything similar. So glad you asked. Uh, we, we work with PayPal. We've worked with Square. We are more akin to a credit card network. So what, what Flexa is doing is not a replacement for crypto networks, which are ultimately a, a really valuable settlement layer. We're an authorization layer on top of crypto networks that merchants can plug into so that they can accept payments from people who hold crypto assets. So think of us as an alternative to Visa or to MasterCard or to the Amex network. We're, we're that for this future of, of assets and value transfer. Does that make sense? I can I can definitely yeah, let's unpack that because I I think I mean I think if you talk to the average person and and I like to think of myself as <laughs> the average person I'm like you know you know when you you know think about what Visa is and Mastercard and what role do they play I, I mean I'm just like okay they're just taking one point five percent of every but like where you know they're not the bank they're just kind of a, a communication layer right but do they actually have liquidity they need to front. And, you know, there's a whole business model behind that that I just, I, I, I don't know about. Right. Yeah, so there are two interesting things here. One, they are a dumb messaging layer. Visa's <laughs> network is called VisaNet, and it's like sending a message through LinkedIn. You send instructions about what uh, payment a customer wants to make, and then the bank says, yeah, great, this is cool. We're going to go ahead and uh, approve this transaction or decline this transaction. No money flows through VisaNet. Money still goes over bank transfers at the end of the day, and they call this process settlement. Uh, our, our key insight was that that's not how you should do things in the age of the internet. You shouldn't be sending credit cards, personal information, sensitive data through LinkedIn messages. Instead, you should be cryptographically signing transactions and then sending the signatures. And so what we've built is uh, a 2024, 2025, 2030 era replacement for that. And we've built it in such a way that it can be really plug and play for merchants. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's that's where we're heading. And and uh, I think that's very surprising because a lot of people look at how much a visa payment costs and think, oh, they must be adding a lot of value there. In fact, it costs that much because it's a very high margin and clunky and lots of intermediaries involved system. That that interchange network is not a benefit to society. It's it's a giant cost that that's been quantified. I think the the Kansas City Fed commissioned a study, and it turns out that the U.S. lights 2% of its GDP on fire every year just to help payments take place. So wow. if you think of buyers and sellers as this super efficient scheme, no, credit cards make it really, really dirty and cumbersome and slow. Who, who's the main like beneficiary from a, a product like Flexa taking fire, right? Or catching fire, and you know, suddenly it's everywhere. Is it um, the merchants who really are saving money here? Is it the, the consumer? Walk us through that. I like to think it's everybody. Uh, certainly, it's the merchants. They get adoption of uh, a new form of, of tender or a new payment method at their at their terminals. They get access to new customers who want to spend these assets. They get access to a younger demographic, and and that's true not only in terms of where we see the usage, but also in terms of how low we can go. Bank accounts and, and credit cards have an 18 year old uh, minimum age in most cases, and so we can go down to 13, right? Because this is an internet asset. Uh, this is all very, very interesting in the context of uh, where we are today. But I think as we move forward and as we start to see stable coins become more regulated and more well adopted in the US, or maybe even a, a Fed issued CBDC, well, suddenly this is a, a currency that everyone has access to. And it's not encumbered by credit scoring blocking people out from access to the financial system. It's not encumbered by uh, teens wanting to get bank accounts and not going through the process of that. And so instead, bartering through uh, Instagram. Uh, like cash app transfers and things like that. There's there's a lot that we can do to make the system more open, more uh, valuable, and and more ultimately uh, affordable to both merchants and customers alike. I think we benefit in the long run because I think prices go down as a result of that. Oh, I like that, um, especially in in the face of just inflation and everything like that. I mean, uh, if it could actually have like an effect like that, where it actually drives prices down in the free market um, because it's just unlocking more capital efficiency or, or something. 
Um, that would be it's super cool. Headway loss of five hundred sixty billion dollars a year and putting it back into the economy at no cost. It's crazy. That's crazy. I love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love it. What fixes this, right? <laughs> I want to go back. Um, I want to go back to your your first or, or my first point actually. Uh, my my kind of like opening statement. Um, you know, a lot of people say, "No, this is cool. Like this is great. Like a potential, you know, two percent of GDP, six hundred billion dollars. Let's get it going." But nobody uses crypto right now for payments. And I think everybody wants to come back and say, you know, nobody uses crypto. So how do you respond to that? And I want to ask you, Trev, like, how do you respond to that? Do you kind of come from the camp of like, that's actually a fallacy? And here's all this data about like, people actually are using it. You just don't realize it. Is it something more like, it's just going to take some time, but it's happening. You know, here's how long, 10 years, 20 years, or... I mean, I, the other camp I hear a lot of people say is that's not what it's meant for. You know, crypto is meant for to be a savings technology and you hoard these things and you're not supposed to. So where do you stand on that spectrum? Yeah, I'd say we see we see two things. One is people are spending this and it does tend to correlate with market cycles. Mm -hmm. And then two, when we think of crypto, we're fairly coin agnostic. We're not thinking of the current set of Bitcoin, Ether, Solana networks and, and tokens that we have today. We're thinking of every single type of value should move using crypto. We're thinking of crypto as the internet of, of money, essentially. Uh, so what's interesting about the trends that we do see are that Bitcoin remains our number one most spent token uh, or coin. USDC is a fast follower, uh, and that tends to swell when prices go up, which is counterintuitive to me. I would think people would want to hoard when prices go up. But uh, I think we're still in a phase of, of crypto being fairly novelty when it comes to payments. And I think what unlocks that is more brands getting in on the party, governments getting in on the party and starting to use this technology for what it is. It's, it's a technology. Mm. So I think we're going to see a lot of, of shift toward other types of tokens. I'll personally never be too interested in spending my Bitcoin. It's more of a gimmick to spend my Bitcoin, but uh, I, I foresee a long-term hold for that. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to stable coins and other types of assets, uh, it definitely gets a lot more interesting. Yeah. How but we long? do see. Oh, so sorry. What was that? But we do see spending. We see consistent spending throughout the yeah, worst and, of it. And I like that that um that kind of visualization where like you know as as the market cycles kind of you know ebb and flow every four years or so there's you know a, a big run up and people kind of take profit and start spending maybe and then the bear market everybody wants to hoard and say you know we're holding on for dear life and yeah. um you know so I I think that's really interesting. But um, I, I want to press you just a little bit, like when you talk to investors or talk to, you know, not saying that anything you say is investment advice or any sort of representations like that. But like, how do you how do you help people rationalize when crypto payments will will be prolific or, or, or proliferating throughout, you know, the economy? Is it going to be 10 years? Do you, you know, do you brace people for 20 years? Where's your timeline? We talk about this a lot. I think there are two tipping points that I find really interesting. One is the U.S. government getting behind either private industry stable coins, which I think probably will happen within the next year, uh, or issuing a CBDC. And I would mm. say that's two, three years out. Wow. Uh, what I think that means is the, the Fed decides that dollars can be spent on Ethereum or on Avalanche, and suddenly uh, merchants are clamoring to open themselves up to a broader set of benefits, right? Lower costs, no fraud, faster transactions. Uh, that then ab it obfuscates or abstracts the, the fact that it's crypto away from the experience, right? You might start seeing Avalanche USDC in your banking app, and you'll never know it's Avalanche USDC because it's just a, a government authorized stablecoin. That's one. The more interesting one to me is the idea that a big brand would get behind issuing their own token. Uh, perhaps as part of a loyalty network. So let's imagine there, there are a couple scenarios how this could play out, but we've seen Starbucks dip their toes into NFTs with Starbucks Odyssey. We've seen Nike create dot swoosh. It would be fairly triv trivial for a, a star token or, or a Nike coin to be issued as part of that. And suddenly you give that to your most valuable customers, make it spendable in your stores. That's a cycle and a flywheel that, that I think could be very, very compelling uh, in terms of crypto as a mainstream adopting uh, tool or, or mainstream adoption narrative. The the other way that happens is a brand like, let's say, TikTok comes along and decides to start incentivizing their creators. We're already seeing this with X yeah. and X payments. But if you start paying your creators in your own token, 
and you can have that token spendable down the street at Chipotle with with Flexa. That's a pretty cool loop that gets Gen Z and Gen Alpha in on the on the mix. And that's when things start to go a little wild as well. So that's where I see neither of those are pure crypto adoption for the sake of crypto cases. They are mainstream use cases that I think make a lot of sense in the payments context. I'd say all of those things happen in the next five years. And, truly. And, do, and do you see um, like the regulatory sort of environment being more conducive to that kind of stuff? I know like obviously there's the court cases that are going down and, and, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not sure if you are, but like, can you comment on any of the regulatory landscape you see unfolding that might come to bear on this kind of business? Yeah. I mean, it's so funny to work with, we, we work with uh, the offices authoring different legislation around these topics. Uh, and it's so funny to see how much the window has shifted, right? The, the window of acceptable discourse has gotten larger in terms of crypto and crypto legislation. And it's also shifted more toward uh, openness, I would say. And certainly it's going to be tied to administrations. So depending on our next president, we might see things swing one way or another. And, and it, in my mind, it's still pretty unpredictable how that goes. Uh, for example, uh, a CBDC under um, a, a Republican majority might be too privacy intrusive, or a CBDC under a Democratic majority might be um, too crypto. <laughs> and, yeah. and it'll be interesting to see how that window shifts in response to foreign governments, because I know there are other governments that are very involved in CBDCs. The Mika legislation in Europe has made it much more feasible for crypto industry to operate abroad. Uh, I think the U.S. is going to have to do some stuff in response, and I, I, I'm optimistic about that, honestly. I think it's better for Americans. Yeah, and I know um, I, I just saw earlier today, um, you know, about how much uh, kind of Coinbase and some of these bigger firms are, are putting, you know, I think 85 to $100 million worth of lobbying dollars, right, you know, to to get these policies to be fair and to represent our voice and all of the entrepreneurs and the innovators that have been working for the past, you know, let's call it 15 years since Bitcoin was invented, maybe the better part of 10 years or whatever, you know, since people are really starting to build with, with no clear regulatory bodies, with no clear guidelines, with, with you know, just IRS saying one thing, you know, SEC saying another, CFTC, it's like none of these people uh, in all these different organizations, God bless them, they got a hard job. Um, but, you know, it's like, it's a, you know, we, we, we've been scratching for, for legislation. And so anyhow, finally, we've got enough money and enough market value and, and publicly listed companies that we could leverage that and start to, to get good, you know, legislature passed. And, and so I'm excited. And, and clearly, you know, from your vantage point, there's, there's a lot of exciting things as well, developing positively. Um, I want to get your thoughts though. Um, you know, you kind of mentioned it in terms of just like savings uh, across like the visa network, but also there's, a different layer um, that I think when I was reading a little bit about Flexa, just about like the Forex stuff. And, and, you know, a lot of people don't really understand foreign exchange or how it works or how an international company hedges foreign exchange risk. Can you talk about how Flexa comes to play um, in that, you know, trillion dollar, you know, whatever, six trillion dollar a day industry? Yeah, when we first saw how this could all fit together, my head exploded because the savings <laughs> are so astronomical and you never really think about the fact that overseas vendor payments are typically made through Forex, right? But but digital currencies and digital assets are borderless, and they represent this really interesting opportunity to completely cut Forex out of the picture. So for example, and, and we think about this in the context of payments a lot, if there were um, a, a Chinese tourist wanting to spend uh, ECNY, which is the, the digital renminbi token uh, that the, the Chinese government has issued, their CBDC, if someone wanted to spend this digital renminbi token uh, when they were traveling in, say, California, they wanted to pop into an Ulta Beauty and spend uh, their ECNY token. Now, that you can't do that today using Flexa, but the future could be that we trade ECNY for Bitcoin, maybe on a Chinese exchange, and then we take Bitcoin and trade it for what Ulta wants to receive, which could be anything they want using Flexa, but let's just say it's USD. Bitcoin to USD and ECNY to Bitcoin those don't include Forex. And Bitcoin to Bitcoin is just a balancing transfer. And so what we've done is completely eliminate a Forex exchange cost for a Chinese tourist who's traveling abroad. Now, if you can start to apply that to businesses, if you can start to apply that to all kinds of commerce, 5.6, 5, I guess it's $6 trillion a day. I was thinking of, of, sorry, the GDP cost savings for payments. That's even more astronomical. Yeah. And that's money that can go back into the pockets of, again, you and me. It's yeah. wild. 
I'm 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 optimistic, and uh, you, you paint a really <laughs> a really beautiful picture of the future. And and obviously, you you, you guys are passionate about it. You guys are building it. Um, you know, is this is Flexa going to be something that runs in the background, or will the consumers? I, I know you mentioned Ulta Beauty, um, big brand. My wife's there all the time. Um, and Chipotle, another big brand, public company. Um, are people going to just see Flexa on at Chipotle? How's that all going to work? Where are you going to meet the customer? I think we'll be very akin to the Amex logo on the back of your credit card. So merchants will know that they can accept payments using our protocol or our integrations. Apps, and we're already talking to some really exciting apps about this, will integrate our SDKs into their wallets or just make payments directly to a QR code or a standard payment request. Uh, and Flexa will be a way for you to look at a, a door, see a sticker, and know that you can pay with your digital assets. I, I think that's where we end up. We're not interested in being a new consumer-facing brand. We're not interested in competing with wallets. We think wallets are doing a great job of building really dynamic and valuable customer experiences. We want to add more tools to their arsenal and just provide a better experience for everybody. Epic. And um, before we let you go, I, I'm, I'm curious to understand... Um, about you know a little bit more about the crypto components here to the Flexa network. Um, are you guys merely um, you know a Web two company that is helping uh, you know people you know facilitate transactions in crypto, um, or is there you know a crypto component yourself with maybe a Flexa coin or some level of decentralization? Good question. Yeah, I wish we were just a Web two company sitting on top of all of this. Uh, it would be a lot easier. <laughs> when we got going, we needed a way to make a Bitcoin payment happen near instantaneously for a cup of coffee. And our bar was that you had to be able to make a payment with a digital currency in 300 milliseconds or less, because that was the time affordance we had from the fine folks at some of the coffee companies we were working with in terms of how much longer our payments could take. So we had to build a lot of DeFi infrastructure. Some of that has now been spun out. Some of it's been open sourced. Uh, and we still use that collateralization technology today. On top of that, though, we have a lot of plumbing that looks at how to make this whole ecosystem carbon negative. We're the first carbon negative payments company, period, crypto, non-crypto. We look at how to make uh, these payments compliant without sacrificing customer information. So every payment you make on, on Flexa is completely private from the merchant. The merchant doesn't see any data about you and every payment looks the same, mm -hmm. but you can still make a payment successfully at these large merchants in any denomination because we're complying with the, the government regulations that would apply. Uh, and, and these payments are ultimately going to work with the majority of payment service providers. So there's a lot that we do to make crypto work with those requirements. Um, collateralization being one of them, but uh, there's there's a lot more under the hood than I think even we would love. We'd love for this to be so simple, but but nothing worth doing is easy. And yeah. so uh, in, in terms of our info, we're, we're very proud of what we've built over the last six years. And certainly there's there's far more to come. I love it. Well, well how can people kind of stay in touch? Uh, wh where do you guys post most of your information? Uh, do you have a big community? How can people follow along? Great question. We are on X. We are exploring some of the other social media platforms, but but generally folks can find us at Flexa HQ. Our website is flexa.co and flexa.co is the place to uh, learn more about what we've built, what we're doing and follow along on our blog. So uh, I would point folks generally to X or to our website. And uh, certainly as we grow the community of people who are interested in this, including merchants and developers alike, uh, we'll be looking to introduce more places for those folks to connect as well. Incredible. All right, Trevor, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and everybody at home watching, hope you learned something, hope you had fun and uh, come back and we got some more guests for you. Thank you so much, Bryce. Let's do it again sometime. You Appreciate bet. it.